Uh, welcome to the 40th Annual Nash Memorial Lecture. My name is Dr. Tom Phoenix. I'm the Dean of Campion College, and I'm also on the Nash Lecture Committee. Uh, I'm also going to be your MC tonight. It's my great honor and pleasure to be the MC tonight. Um, the Nash Memorial Lecture Series was established in 1979 uh, in honor of the first president of Campion College at the University of Regina, Father Peter Nash. The objective of the Nash Lecture Series was to honor uh, individuals who distinguished themselves in the humanities, in the, the uh, fine arts, in the natural sciences and the social sciences. And tonight's speaker is no exception to that. Uh, Dr. Gina Messina is an associate professor of religious studies at Ursuline. Ursuline? Uh, it's with an E, so I wasn't sure if it was Ursuline or Ursuline, but it's Ursuline uh, College. Um, so uh, in her previous life, she was the dean of, of uh, their professional and graduate studies program. Um, and uh, she's also been uh, a, professor, a visiting professor of theological ethics at another Jesuit institution, Loyola Marymount. Um, Dr. Gina Messina uh, has uh, written uh, a number of books. Uh, she has uh, spoken at a lot of events like uh, 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 the, the uh, U.S. Uh, News Circuit. She's uh, talked at uh, MSNB and MSNBC, uh, NPR. Uh, she's done a TEDx talk. Um, she's spoken at the United Nations uh, uh, Committee on the uh, Standing of Women. Um, and tonight, she's going to give us uh, a presentation on uh, the feminist revolution in religion in the context of the upcoming decade that we're coming into. So please join me in welcoming our 40th annual NAS lecturer, Dr. Gina Messina. Hello, everybody. I just want to say I am overwhelmed by how many of you are here, and I heard they have an overflow room, and I thought it was just talk. But I saw there were people in it, and I was really surprised. So I know it's snowing, and it's cold, and I'm from Cleveland, and it's cold in Cleveland, but not like here. So I really appreciate you making the time to come out tonight. Um, and I got into Regina on Monday evening, which, um, I've been here for a couple of days, and I just want to say it has been the most delightful experience um, in all sincerity. I get to travel often and go to different places to talk, which is really a privilege. And I have never, honestly, have been someplace that I have felt so welcomed and have just experienced such generosity and compassion from everybody. So really. You have a beautiful community, um, and Shannon and I are going to be going to wine country together. Um, Dr. Anderson and I are going to be sharing syllabi, um, and Earl, who I met in Father Jeff's class yesterday, he and I had a chat beforehand, and I told him that he is not allowed to give me any difficult questions at the end of this presentation. So we'll see how that goes. So thank you again for having me. Um, this um, topic, the new feminist revolution in religion, is one near and dear to my heart. And um, people often say to me, you can't be Catholic and feminist. That's really an oxymoron. And I'm here to tell you it's really not. I think that they go together very, very well. And um, I wanted to start off talking a little bit about the Catholic Church and um, why the church is important to me. So uh, we have this amazing rock star Pope, right? I mean, what other Pope made it onto Rolling Stone magazine cover? Seriously. Um, he gets bigger crowds than Lady Gaga. So I think we can all take a lesson from him. And there's a reason for that. In my lifetime, there's been four popes. I really only remember three. I'm a cradle Catholic, a first-generation American, and I come from a very traditional um, Catholic Sicilian family. So um, being Catholic is in my blood. It's just part of who I am. It's my culture, and it's important to me. 
And I remember the day that Pope Francis uh, became Pope and watching him walk out onto the balcony and bow before the crowd and asking the crowd to pray for him. And I was overwhelmed by that. And um, I cried a little bit. I was really amazed by this man who had a very different approach to leadership in the church. And so it was later that evening that um, I very surprisingly got an email uh, from Pope Francis. And he said that he was familiar with the work that I had been doing around women in the church. And I was really blown away. I mean, really blown away. Um, and he said, you know, uh, this is an area that I really think is important to focus on. And I'd love to hear some of your ideas. So I immediately started writing notes and thinking of all of the things that I thought were so critical to share with him. And then my alarm clock went off. <laughs> and that's a true story. I really had that dream the night that Pope Francis became Pope. I really, in my mind, thought that he was going to call on me to help with these matters in the church. Now, I keep hoping, and he, you know, has been a little busy, so he hasn't quite gotten to email me yet. But I still think there could be a possibility. Um, but I have um, been just really overwhelmed by this pope. And um, I've been asked, what is the most progressive thing that you have seen happen in the church in your lifetime? And so let me say, in my lifetime, I was not alive during Vatican II. Um, because people always say, no, no, Vatican II. And I say, well, I, I wasn't here for that. But I, I know about it. Um, but during my lifetime, I would definitely have to say it would be seeing Pope Francis become pope and seeing his reaction to the people. And that is something that has really touched my heart. So as I have grown into an adult, um, like so many of us, we end up having questions about the church. We have questions about our beliefs. And like the students that I work with and that you work with, um, we see our students going through so many changes and growing and evolving and learning to think critically. Um, and we really don't know what to do with those questions sometimes. And it's scary to ask questions about our faith and our tradition and finding a place where we feel comfortable. Um, and there have always been things that I have questions about, and certainly they develop out of my own history and my own growth experience. Um, but these are some key things for me that keep me really grounded in the Catholic tradition. And so I often talk about the foundational teachings of Jesus. And for me, that is something that I think we should all really be paying attention to. And when I look at the Gospels, um, when I refer back to Scripture, I always come back to these four points. Love, inclusion, liberation, and social justice. And to me, those are the primary principles of the Catholic tradition. That is what keeps me grounded in the faith, along with Catholic social teaching, which is, of course, also grounded in those principles and really thinking about what it means to be responsible for our communities, what it means to be a participating member in our community. What does it mean to recognize our own position in society, the privilege that we have? What does it mean to recognize where privilege is lacking for others? to recognize the poverty that exists, to stand in solidarity with those who are disenfranchised. And that is where I am at as a Catholic. It is those principles that really speak to me. And so people say, well, feminism and Catholic, I don't quite get it. And um, honestly, sometimes I'm not always sure I quite get it myself. It's a journey. Um, and I say that it's, it's an interesting identity to have because Catholics say, oh, you're a feminist, you're not really Catholic. 
And Catholics say, oh, you're a feminist? You're not really Catholic. Did I just say that twice? I did. I meant it the other way. Feminists say, you're Catholic, you're not a feminist. So you get it from both ends. Um, and I think it's really important to be true to ourselves and know why we have the identities that we do and why we have the values and the beliefs that we do and to hold firm in those even when we're challenged. Um, while at the same time being open to dialogue and hearing other people's ideas. So what exactly is feminism? I think Rosemary Radford Ruther has a really great definition. Um, and it's one I refer back to often. And she says that, you know, feminism is about honoring the full humanity of all women and all men. It's about every person. And so I know oftentimes when people hear the word feminism, they have a range of ideas on what that means. I often get asked if I shave my underarms and my legs. I will not comment. But it's funny to me that that's what we connect with the idea of feminism. Do you not, I'm saying do you not like men? It's usually said in a very different way. Um, but we have lots of ideas of feminism being angry um, and being a movement that wants to see women in a position of authority above men. Um, and that is not at all where I come to my feminist values. Um, for me, it is really this idea that we need to honor the full humanity of every person, acknowledging that we're all made in the image of God. And I think that is something that we can all connect to and understand. I don't think that anybody um, thinks that it is reasonable for any person to be disenfranchised, right? Um, but I also think sometimes that maybe the word feminism needs a rebranding because a lot of us really struggle with it. Now, I've talked about being a feminist since I was probably about 12 years old, and I can tell you my Sicilian Catholic father was not always very thrilled with that. Um, but it was really informed by my upbringing and by my family and by my experiences in understanding that I was going to have a particular role in the world, a role within the church and within family that was very different from the role that my brother was going to have. And when I got old enough to really question that, it didn't sit well with me. And I had to really struggle with that and try to figure out what is my path and what do I want for myself and why are some things seen as acceptable and why are some things not. And so feminism for me started to grow at that point point in looking at those questions. Um, and I think that Ruther has a very important definition, but I also think that bell hooks um, helps us to really kind of hone in and recognize the idea of feminism on a broader spectrum um, that really connects to some critical issues that we don't always discuss when it comes to feminism. And so she talks about the idea that feminism is a movement to end sexism, but also needs to acknowledge the ways that varying identities overlap to create particular experiences for persons. So that the experience of sexism for a white woman is not the same as the experience of sexism for a woman of color. And that is really critical to understand when we're talking about the movement. So um, I wanted to give us a little bit of a background on this. And so I think that it's really important to understand that feminism is a liberative movement. Like all liberative movements, they develop with the idea that we want to eradicate some issue, some form of oppression. But oftentimes what happens with liberative movements is they become very focused and forget that 
they may not be including all the voices. And they be, can become oppressive themselves. And that is a big critique of feminism. Um, and so for me, I think that it's really important to understand that feminism, yes, is about ending sexism, but it really is about uprooting all oppressions. Because you cannot uproot one oppression without uprooting them all. So as much as feminism is focused on, ish, on the issue of sexism, it is also very deeply committed to looking at issues related to immigration. And so we need to understand that it has a broad spectrum. So whenever I talk about feminism, people say, oh, it's about equality. Um, and we all know that word, equality. And it seems like it makes sense. Don't we all want to be equal? But there's a problem with the word equal, because if we all get the same thing, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have what all what we need, right? And I, I love this image. There's another image that a lot of the students are familiar with, and they might be familiar with this one too, but we talked about a different one yesterday. Um, and I think it really does a good job in demonstrating when you give the equal amount, not everybody has what they need to get what they need in life, right? And so what I think we really need to be talking about is equity. And what does it mean to be an equitable society? What does it mean to meet people where they are at and acknowledge what their needs are and ensure that we each have what we need to have a good life? Um, we often talk about the idea in Christianity uh, of loving our neighbor. But I find today that most of us don't know who our neighbors are. We don't know who our neighbors are. We don't know what our, our neighbors want. And we don't know what our neighbors need. We all know who the Kardashians are. They've become our neighbors in some way with this, you know, new media access that we have. Um, and when we talk about equity, it sometimes feels uncomfortable. Like, why should I get less of something and somebody else get more of something? And that's not really the idea that you're losing out in favor of somebody else, but instead of really thinking about what this idea means to love your neighbor and care about what they need, care about them having what they should have to have a good life. And finally, feminism is intersectional. So how many of you are familiar with the term intersectionality? I'm just so impressed. I'm just so impressed. Um, I often ask that question, and people are usually like, I've never heard that term before. Um, but intersectionality is the idea that we need to recognize that it's not just a conversation about gender. And that's what we often do. We want to talk just about gender or race or economic issues. Um, we want to talk about culture or just religion or sexuality. But it's so much more than that. Each of us has our own lived experience. We have our own history, our own culture, our own background. And all of those things overlap and interweave to create a particular experience. And so what my experience is as a Catholic Sicilian woman um, is very, very different from the experience of my colleague who is, you know, a Latina, um, a Latina feminist, uh, lesbian, uh, Christian. We have totally different experiences, right? And we often don't think about that. We want to talk about ourselves in these very narrow categories. And it doesn't fully acknowledge who we are as people and why we have the ideas that we do. Or what type of experience we might be having in the world. Um, what kind of an oppression we might be experiencing. So, um, you know, when I talk about the idea of, of being a woman and feeling oppressed, um, it also 
oftentimes almost feels silly for me because, you know, I'm a very privileged person. I mean, I'm here in Regina talking to all of you. Clearly, I am a privileged person. Um, but I think a really good example of this is to think about pay equity, at least the statistics for me in the United States. Um, we often cite the statistic that women make 77 cents on the dollar. And that is true for white women. But African American women only make 64 cents on the dollar, and Latino women make 54 cents on the dollar. And that is intersectionality right there. Recognizing that these different parts of our identities intersect to create an experience for us in a particular oppression that's gonna be different from what others experience. And it also really informs our ideas about things that are happening in the world. So I have these extra photos, but I kind of already said them. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself just a little. But I love this quote um, from Audre Lorde. Um, I've been asking, you know, um, if, Y'all in Canada are interested in what's happening in the United States and are, yes, yes, I know. I was, <laughs> it's, um, it's an important conversation. And so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful um, for uh, the dialogue. And um, when we had our most uh, recent presidential election, I found that when I was talking with people that, a lot of um, persons were choosing to vote for a candidate um, based on one issue, you know? Um, and a lot of us feel that way. A lot of us feel very strongly about particular things, and that one thing outweighs everything else. And so regardless of who that candidate is, we're gonna check the box because that issue is important and you feel like you're doing something about it. But Here's the thing, and I love this quote because I think Audre Lorde says it so well, is that there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Um, and I think it's such an important idea for us to absorb and to really consider when we're making decisions about our communities and the way that we want to engage our communities and what it might be that you wanna vote for or how it might be that you wanna help your neighbor and recognizing that sometimes when we hone in on one thing that it can create a host of issues. So for me, feminism really addresses all of these things. And I think that it connects with teachings in the church, these ideas of love, inclusion, liberation, and social justice, the idea of caring about our community, being committed to the poor, recognizing our responsibility to our neighbors, I think those fit together well. And so when I think about bringing a feminist lens to the Catholic Church or a feminist lens to religion, um, there are a couple of things that really stand out to me that I think are important to discuss. And so the first would be talking about our understanding of God. And I know that a lot of us have different language for God. Um, some of us say the divine or the sacred. Um, whatever that means to us. When we talk about God, uh, well, to many of us, this is it, right? This is the ultimate source. This is uh, the source that we are accountable to, the being that has given us life and how we create our moral values, our beliefs, our understandings, and how do we understand God? And so I like to ask people, when you close your eyes and you imagine God, what do you see? Does anybody want to share? Anybody willing? Yes, yes. 
a lot of us see God as an old white man on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, right? A lot of us do. Does anybody have a different image? So, yes, please. Tell me your name again. Wambui, and I have met several times. She is lovely and amazing, and I always ask her to tell me your name again. I'm so sorry. Um, Wambui said that she often imagines a cloud parting in the sky with a bright light coming down, um, which is a lovely, lovely image. I have a friend who told me, when I think of God, I see a beautiful, swirling, fuchsia color, and I just imagine love. And I said, really? <laughs> Come on. It's a lovely idea. Um, like um, this lovely woman, can I ask your name? Who sees? Julie. Julie said, um, I also um, have an image of God that isn't quite this, but really an image of Jesus that I used to see in grade school. I went to Catholic grade school, and I cannot find the image anywhere to ever say this is it, but there's this one image, and it's always in my head, and as a feminist, I'm always talking to myself about what's appropriate God language, what's appropriate God imagery, um, and yet this is it for me, right? Because we learn these things and they stick with us. And they also impact the way that we think about God, the way that we connect God to our societies, the way that we think about power structures in our societies. And so if God is an old white man, then who has the power in our society? And I think that's a really important message to take away because if we think about our society, really the foundation of our structures within society are, are grounded in our religion. They really are. And so when we talk about God as being a man, um, then really how could any woman have the same level of power or privilege that a man does, because certainly a woman could not represent this idea of the divine. So our language is a problem. Our imagery is a problem. And how do we address that? Um, and apparently my friend who sees the purple fuchsia swirl has mastered it. But I have not. I have not. And it's something I'm always thinking about. And I still say God he in class when I'm teaching and I catch myself and I'm doing better with it, but um, it is just kind of the go-to for most of us when we're talking about God and we're going to use a pronoun, we say he. Well, he, you know, is amazing, <laughs> right? Uh, but we say he. Um, and how can we break that habit? And are there other appropriate images and language that we can use. Well, I think that's up to each of us. And I always say that what is comfortable to you, if it is a fuchsia swirling light, awesome, <laughs> right? Um, but how can we find that for ourselves? If we look at a lot of theologians, they talk about different ideas. Some like the idea of using parental language, godmother, godfather. Some people like the idea of using gender neutral language, like the divine. Um, Sally McFaig talks about God as friend, which I think is really interesting to think about God as your friend, right? Um, but it's up to us to really challenge those concepts and to be open to new ideas and thinking about how that might really impact our communities if we're willing to move beyond traditional male language for God. Next, I wanted to talk about complementarity, which is a really important part of the Catholic tradition. So we start out with this idea. Um, and so I understood my role. I understood what I was supposed to be doing. And, um, and then I had a very long-term struggle with infertility. Um, and it left me with some very unpleasant feelings about where I fit 
into my church? Where did I fit into my community and my family who, believe me, were knocking on the door always calling, when are you going to have a baby? When are you going to have a baby? Um, and without wanting to say, I'm trying, right? Like, you know, come on, give me a break. Um, but it was a painful struggle. It was really painful. Um, and it left me with a lot of questions and really thinking about these teachings in the church about complementarity and what it meant for me as someone who was not able to get pregnant. And of course, a lot of people would say to me, well, you just need to refer back to Sarah. You're being impatient. And I was like, oh boy. So after 10 years, I adopted a beautiful little girl, my daughter Sarah, who I shared a picture with Father Sammy today. We had an amazing lunch, amazing. Um, and I told him that um, there is no doubt in my mind that God decided that Sarah, my daughter Sarah was to be my daughter. Um, uh, we look exactly alike, exactly alike. Very different cultural backgrounds. We look exactly alike. You, wouldn't, you would never believe it. It's really amazing. Um, and so I have this beautiful, amazing child that did not come the way that I thought that she was going to come. And then, again, I heard the stories that I was, oh, you're impatient, just wait. You're going to get pregnant now. It's going to happen. These are the things that we say to women that struggle with infertility, and it's a bit frustrating. Um, and also, I really wanted everybody to recognize that my daughter is my daughter. She was meant to be my daughter, even though it happened in a way that most thought, you know, don't think it's going to happen, and that's okay. But then it says to me, if we're talking about these roles of complementarity, what about persons who are not physically capable of bearing children? What about persons who don't want to have children? We often think about um, what we're going to do in the world. We're going to make great change. We're going to do amazing things. But if you're a parent, you really need to balance that. I often think about Gandhi. You know, Gandhi was an incredible leader in our world. But we often don't realize that Gandhi's children suffered greatly with not having their father present. Um, one of his sons um, became very ill, uh, and it created a lot, of, a lot of difficulty for his family. We don't talk about that. We acknowledge what an amazing person Gandhi was. And I don't say that to take away, but I say that there are some that feel that perhaps children is not their calling. And maybe they're not able to be a parent and do the great work in the world at the same time. And I know you're going to say that's the priesthood. But for those of you who may not want to be in the priesthood, and of course, there are those who feel called to different types of relationships. And what do we say about that in the context of complementarity? And this idea of natural law, does it have to be the center of where we build our foundation as a society? And I don't think that it does. Father Jeff and I had a little bit of a conversation about this yesterday, along with some of his amazing, amazing students. Such talented students at this college, I want to say. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what I think should be at the center. But I think complementarity is something that needs to be acknowledged. Now, I very much hope that you all laugh at this image. And I asked Mike, wherever he is, is this going to be OK? And he was like, I think it's funny. And I was like, all right. Um, um, if you can't see what it says. So it's an image of Mary Magdalene preaching the first message of the resurrection. And we often forget that it was a woman who received the message of the resurrection and preached the first message. Mary Magdalene actually is 
you know, a very big reason why we have the Christian church today. Had she not preached that first message, we wouldn't all be sitting here having this conversation. And, um, of course, the apostles did not believe her. And hence, hashtag fake news. It just really made me laugh. I couldn't help myself. Um, and so... <laughs> What does that mean when we think about women's roles in the church today? What roles should women have? How should women engage their church communities? And how can we honor the relationships that Jesus had with women in his ministry and the roles that he gave to those women? Those are questions that I think that we should be asking. And in fact, I honestly think that the relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene is an excellent, excellent example of intersectionality. And the reason being is that Mary Magdalene, you may or may not know, was a very wealthy, privileged woman. And she helped fund Jesus' ministry. She supported Jesus' ministry. And Jesus was you know, an impoverished Jew. He was on a very different um, level in the power structure. Mary Magdalene had a significant amount of privilege that Jesus did not have. And I think it's a real example of the way that we don't always understand power structures playing out. And Mary Magdalene could have sat pretty with her money and had a really good life. Um, but really believed in this message of love, inclusion, liberation, and social justice and went on a journey that led to her preaching that first message that brought us here today. And so I think that's something we should be considering when we think about what women's roles should be in the church. And I think it's really important also to understand how we have really done a disservice to the memory of Mary Magdalene throughout history. Early images of her were very similar to this. This is an image of Mary Magdalene where she had her head covered. She appears to be a wealthy, respected woman. And then we have the misinterpretation of who she is and refer to her as a prostitute. Which, quite frankly, if you're looking to discredit a woman, calling her a prostitute is the way to do it. And it really goes back to our ideas connected to complementarity and our sexuality and what is acceptable and what is not. And so the imagery of her shifts throughout history. And suddenly, from a respected woman with her head covered, we have a woman topless with long red locks gazing up at the sky, pleading for forgiveness. What does that do to this woman's legacy and the role that she has played in the foundation of this church? Now, eventually we find out that in fact, it was an inappropriate interpretation. But I can't tell you how many people I run into on a daily basis that still have no idea that Mary Magdalene was a woman of privilege who supported the ministry and was not a prostitute. Now, I want to be cautious also and acknowledge that when we're talking about sex work today, it's an important conversation to be had. Um, and I don't think it is one where we should be speaking poorly of women who choose to engage that field. And I'm certainly not um, wanting to discredit that. But that is a conversation for another time, clearly. So the title of the talk is The New Feminist Revolution in Religion. And I love, love, love this image. It is actually, um, we chose this image as the cover of uh, my most recently published edited volume with my partner in feminism, 
Sochi Aviso from uh, Cal State Northridge. She and I um, have been doing feminist projects together for a very long time, and we call ourselves partners in feminism. Um, and we did this book, and we thought, this is the perfect image, right? Because when we think of the word revolution, we usually think of it as being something really negative, violent, some upheaval, doing something bad. But what about a revolution grounded in love? And this is what I said in Father Jeff's class yesterday, as I said, I really think instead of putting natural law at the center or complementarity at the center, I think we should be putting love at the center. And if we put love at the center, how would that shift the way we engage with each other, with our communities, with our political systems, with all of the many challenges that we have, what would shift? And I love this idea of grounding revolution in love. And so a lot of us hear the word revolution and we think, oh my gosh, that's so big. How could I possibly be engaged in a revolution? I have to make fish sticks for dinner. <laughs> right? Um, I know that feeling. I order pizza way too often. Don't tell anybody. I know, right? Um, yes, but a lot of us have that feeling. Oh my goodness, the daily grind. You wake up and we immediately have that feeling. I didn't get enough sleep. I don't have enough time. I definitely did not have enough coffee. I never have enough coffee. Um, and we're on the go. We've got things to do. We've got people to see. We've got to go to work. We've got to get the kids on the school bus. Somebody has to do the laundry. Somebody has to make dinner. Somebody has to shovel the driveway. Somebody's shoveling tonight. I know they are. My heart goes out to them. But in the midst of all of the things that we're doing, we really are all, all of us, participating in revolution, whether we realize it or not. Because it is the smallest acts done with the greatest love that make the most critical change in our society. And I believe that with all my heart. I really, really do. And so I think it is the conversation you have with your child at the dinner table. It is when you hold the door open for someone, you know, at the restaurant. These small acts of kindness are so important, and we should acknowledge that we participate in those. How are we treating our neighbors? Who is your neighbor? Do you know who your neighbor is? I honestly don't know most of my neighbors. I know some of my neighbors, and I make an effort, and I want to know who they are, and I, I love my community, and um, I love coming to places like this and getting to know everybody. I, I came around and talked to some of you, um, and very luckily, I introduced myself to Scott, who is from Campus Security, and let me know what the secret pathway out was in case, you know, a tomato gets thrown or something. I'm really not concerned that that is going to happen, <laughs> but I love to meet people, and I love to talk to people um, and get to know who you are and acknowledge that, you know, this is it. This is where I find the divine. It's, it's in my neighbor. It's in my community. And that's so important. And so what are we doing on a daily basis? Those small acts count. Not all of us can leave everything behind and give everything to the poor and, you know, live a life as a missionary. It's a beautiful thing. But our society really isn't built for it. You know, I, I have to support my child, right? And you feel the same way if you, you know, you know that we all have responsibilities. We have, some of us have ailing parents that need us. Those responsibilities are just as important. And I think that when we look to scripture and we read the message of Jesus, and Jesus was really calling us to be all in, be all in, 100% in. If you're going to do this, do it. Well, most of us, that is a very serious, serious challenge. And so I think we need to wake up every morning and remind ourselves of what the journey is. Remind ourselves of what our mission, what is your mission? 
what have you decided to commit your life to? And think about what you're going to do that day to get there. And do your best. Because usually I'm lucky if I get to mark one thing off my to-do list for the day, right? Something always happens. But I think it's important that we acknowledge it, that we understand it, and that we try our hardest, and that we put love at the center of those actions, that we recognize that our faith, our value systems, our morals, whatever that means for you in your life, that you recognize that as your grounding and your foundation to help you live out that mission that you know is going to help your neighbor. And to me, I think that is what the revolution is about. Now, um, Solchi and I started a, uh, a blog back in 2011. And I know it sounds a little juvenile, like, oh, we have a blog. Um, and it was great fun. And uh, we had this idea that, um, you know, there's really no place for people to really be connecting, to have conversations around feminist issues in religion, um, you know, across boundaries, different religious traditions, um, talking about gender issues, cultures, whatever it may be. So we developed this blog and committed to um, writing one post every other week, each of us. So we'd have like a couple posts go up a week, and then we'd ask people if they wanted to write. And what happened? Um, within literally two months, our schedule was booked seven days a week with writers and has been ever since. It's been nine years. And so we have this multitude of voices that are writing their ideas and their thoughts about the ways that we should be thinking about theological teachings and connecting to spirituality and what it means to challenge God language. What does it mean to think about our roles in society in a new way and believe that God supports us in that? Um, and what it did was it opened up an opportunity for persons who generally do not have voice to have a voice in a public way. And it created an opportunity for dialogue. So people would respond to these writings and say, hey, I really, I'm not sure I agree with what you're saying here, and this is what I think instead. Um, and we started to see this conversation grow. And today we have readers in 181 countries and a dialogue that is taking place across boundaries and opening up voice for persons who have been silenced and creating new opportunities for a dialogue, which is something that we should all be doing. I think we often talk about, well, agree to disagree. And I'm not so sure that I'm OK with that, because I don't really necessarily feel like I disagree, but more that I have different ideas, and I want to talk about them. And I want to know what your ideas are. And I think I'm going to learn from you. And I think that's how we all learn, is that if we are willing to have dialogue, if we're willing to commit to a conversation, if we're willing to move past the idea of screaming past one another and not hearing anything, which honestly, in the United States, that's all we do. I mean, we are split down the middle. And nobody wants to have a conversation. It's my way or the highway. And I was saying to Father Sammy today that I think I had a bit of a crisis of identity this last year that I haven't necessarily been that vocal about, but really wondering what it means that I'm a feminist and how I engage in dialogue and wondering if I'm part of the problem and how I need to shift the way I'm engaging my neighbor and my community. And it's such a privilege for me to be able to stand up here and share my ideas with you. 
And not everybody has that opportunity. And I want to hear the ideas from those who aren't standing up with a microphone. And that's why, you know, we created this idea of a blog, just a blog, right? It seems uh, juvenile, but at the same point, it was a micro-revolution. And so we can have micro-level revolutions and we can have macro-level revolutions and we're all built for different things. Um, but we should not discount our contributions and we should also, I think, call on ourselves to see how we can be part of the solution and be open to a dialogue rather than a disagreement. So as I've been thinking about my own feminist identity and some of the challenges that I felt, um, I've thought a lot about Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I think that she is an amazing role model and story for us to connect to when we're thinking about intersectionality and thinking about communicating with our neighbor, having a dialogue and moving past anger. And so if you know the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe, she um, appeared to Juan Diego, who was, okay, I've been giving the time limit. My nickname is Motormouth Messina. I can talk forever, forever. <laughs> so, um, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Juan Diego, an Aztec peasant living in Mexico City, modern day Mexico City, um, after they had been um, occupied by the Spaniards and living a very difficult life where he was very much oppressed. And then he had this encounter with Our Lady of Guadalupe. Mary comes to him in a very specific way. She has brown skin. She looks like Juan Diego. She speaks to Juan Diego in his native Aztec language. She's wearing a robe and garments that represent tradition and culture in the Aztec community. And she comes to Juan Diego as a figure in the Christian faith held by this man's oppressors and acknowledges to him his dignity, that he is fully human, that this atrocity of being oppressed is not acceptable and that she honors and values his worth. She sees him as being in the, made in the image of God. And she sends Juan Diego with a message to have a shrine built to her in this spot of her apparition. And um, nobody believes Juan Diego. He's the Aztec peasant. They're not going to take him seriously. And so she sends Juan Diego back with these beautiful flowers that are not possible to bloom in that area. They're not from the area. You would not find them there. And she has, them ro has him roll them up in his cloak, these flowers, to present to the bishop as proof. And when he opens his cloak, the flowers fall out. And here is a shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe on his cloak and we forever know Our Lady of Guadalupe and she has become such a critical figure in that community. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn from that story in acknowledging that sometimes people make bad decisions. It doesn't mean that we're bad people. 
that we can look past differences among us and find our humanity and connect on that and that we really need to honor each other for who we are. And that can be really difficult to do sometimes. I often talk about my own background and my history because I want to make the point that I come to the conversation, I come to my values and beliefs because of my lived experience, and so do each of you. And so does every single person that you feel is wrong. I always like to say, well, yeah, but, but I'm right, right? We all think we're right. And I think that if we can really consider why each of us come to a conversation with the viewpoint that we have, that we understand our lived experiences are different, and that we value each other for who we are, that it'll put us in a better position to respect one another and to be willing to listen and learn from each other in instead of just assuming that we are always right. I am right most of the time, but just kidding. So there's a few images I wanted to show to you of Our Lady of Guadalupe, just quickly, wrong button, um, that as Our Lady of Guadalupe has been embraced, we see that her image has been recreated through contemporary art in a way to represent our own lived experience. And so these images, I think, are so beautiful. And thinking of Our Lady of Guadalupe as representing our grandmothers who sew our clothes and honoring the work that they do as being valued, right? seeing Our Lady of Guadalupe in our everyday lives and in the work that we do. I think that's such an important idea when we can connect ourselves and our experiences to that which we value. And that Our Lady of Guadalupe has become a critical, critical figure of protection and a way to understand the importance of dialogue and respecting each other and as a protector. And so going back to this idea of the new feminist revolution in the new decade, I'm like, we are in a new decade. I did not say Happy New Year once. I said Happy New Decade. I was ready for it. And in this new decade, I think that Our Lady of Guadalupe is a model for us to follow. And I think that love is what we put at the center of our value systems. And I think that if we can do that, we may find ourselves growing into a society that gets back to the values of knowing who our neighbor is. And I think that's a good starting place. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much.